In case you don't know what session you're in, this is cushing, Cooking with Caching, Drupal Code, Sir Fast. R. You might be wondering, where are the links? There are links in this presentation. Where can I find them? You can find them already online at 107.github.io slash cooking dash with dash caching. If you want to take a picture or write that down right now, please do so. Give me a thumbs up when you're ready. At one, at two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm waiting for one more. <laughs> one more, I see one more way in the back. And we're ready to go. Okay. So you might be wondering, who is this weird person in front of you? Why are they dressed up as a chef, despite this hat? It's spectacular on me. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, I am Tess Flynn, otherwise known as Socket Wench. That's Wench, not Wrench. I'm a developer, blogger, and educator, and I'm a platform architect at 10.7. At 10.7, we like making things that matter. We're a 100% remote company, but we are based out of Minneapolis. We do provide a number of different services, including research and strategy, user experience and design, Drupal development, continuous care and support. Give us a hi at the wonderful humans at 107.com. So, we got our outfit on. We're going to step into the kitchen. We're going to get going here. We're going to start cooking. So, we want to design our site for caching. So, how do we do that? Tell me if you've ever had this situation before. You already have your Drupal code, it's all cooked up and it all works in your local and everything looks perfectly fine. And you want to go and throw it into production because you're sure it will work the first time. <laughs> and then later, you might be wondering why doesn't this work? Doesn't every bit of code on my site run every request? You might have put some application code in dot theme and thought, that'll be, that'll be fine, right? That worked in Drupal 6. <laughs> well, all of these are actually easy mistakes to, uh, to make in Drupal 9 and Drupal 10. You might may, uh, be testing only when logged in. When you're logged in, some caching layers are automatically disabled. You may only be testing as user number one. I know I've done it because Drush ULI is really easy <laughs> and I don't need to remember a password. And the thing with uh, Drupal is that with anonymous users, everything is cached. And I do mean everything. <laughs> and there are much more caching layers that you have to go through. Local isn't production. There's a constant background of uh, hum of traffic on, on production. And there are a lot more caching layers that you have to go through. Caching, it's both the cause and the solution to all of our problems. And the thing is that the first anonymous request that is made to a site after a cache clear determines the cache content for all anonymous users. I am looking at you, views random sort plugin. Please do not use that. That doesn't work. <laughs> so you might think I'll just put fresh CR and cron and we'll, everything will be fixed. Well, not really. No, no, please don't do this. <laughs> because one, uh, one thing is that it masks the underlying problem. It might actually seem like it fixes the problem, but it is a workaround. It doesn't actually correct the underlying issues with the cache configuration or your application code. But worse than that, you will make your operations people sad because it causes a stampede. What do I mean by that? Well, let's have a diagram. Here we have response time and regular time on a graph. And this is what your site performance looks like. Yeah, that ain't good. <laughs> You'll notice there's a huge spike right in the middle. And when we go back to the logs, we can correlate it directly with a Drush CR. That's because a Drush CR causes an instant performance drop and a long recovery time because all of the anonymous pages are no longer cached. So every request becomes the first request for someone, has to run the entire Drupal bootstrap and generate the entire page and everything. And then it takes a long time to recover because every other page that is hit by another anonymous user for the first time goes through the same process. This is why you want to be very careful with Drush CR. Caching has layers as well. It's a lot more complicated than just Drupal itself. We can talk about caching from a single variable to planet-sized infrastructure. And it's really like an onion. At the lowest level, you have very simple things like static and Drupal static. On top of that, you might have persistent caching with the Drupal cache API. Then you might have render caching on top of that. You might be running through a reverse proxy like 
varnish. And then you might have a CDN on top of all of that stuff. And you have to keep all of these layers in mind when you design for caching, not just one. So when you want to say, I want to bypass the cache, you have to bypass it at all these layers in order to actually get your code to run every request. And as you can expect, Drupal is designed to not let you do this. In fact, if you try bypassing the cache, it opens a denial of service vector. If I notice that one page on your site takes seven microseconds longer to load than all the other ones, I can write a script that's five lines and probably try to crash your site. Which is why you don't want to do that. Bypassing cache is not good. Cache saves your butt. And the thing is that caching is actually a trade-off. And this is where we have a bit of a hard lesson. We want all of these things. We want our site, the site to always load fast. We want it to be able to handle massive traffic surges without missing a beat. And we also want it to make sure that every time we do an update to our site, it shows up instantly, right? Well, you get to pick two. <laughs> That's it, you get to pick two. And this really sucks because a lot of people are like, well, okay, I, I want my changes to show up quickly. Well, which one do you want to give up? The site is fast or that it crashes or that it doesn't crash when you get lots of traffic? Like, you have to make that trade off. And generally, Drupal makes the trade off that changes should show up more slowly and hope that your editors have some patience. Because not caching actually costs. It costs an additional server load. That can actually be, uh, be the result of downtime. Business from slow responsiveness, as every page has to rebuild itself in order to run every bit of code all the time, you're going to incur an additional number of microseconds that some people will go, I'm done, next site, don't care. And you might have potential downtime if you have that much stuff going after your server at once and the whole thing crashes. So how do we work with caching? We're going to start with the smallest bit, some tiny morsels of caching. So we want to do some caching within, uh, within one request, and this is something that we can do as module developers. This gives us some very small speed ups, but also, more importantly, it encourages use of object-oriented methods rather than storing variables all over the place. That way you actually don't need to worry about storing those or the performance impl implications thereof. A lot of this has to do with static variables. Now, static variables persist within their scope, typically a method or a function. And these are different from static class properties. So here we actually have a class. I could barely see it from way back there, so hopefully you can still see it. Again, the presentation is online if you want to look at it later. So we have a function, and we have a static variable called my variable. And this is initialized from the first time that this is called during, that, uh, during the first anonymous request. Afterwards, we are going to check to see if that value is empty. We initialize it as null, so it's empty, so we're going to initialize it here. Now the value is no longer empty, and then we return it. The next, uh, the next time this function is invoked within the same request, PHP is going to go, oh, that's already initialized. I don't need to initialize it. It's not empty anymore, so I don't need to run this. I'm just going to return it. And it just falls right through like, a, like an accessor on a class. It's really a nice pattern. Sometimes, though, you do want to actually reset it within the same request. And you want to bypass it where appropriate, or at least tell it, hey, I'm changing something. Please regenerate the values. So how do you do that? It's actually really easy. You add a Boolean parameter to the, uh, to the function. And then it's not just if empty, it's also or reset. So if you're resetting the, uh, the environment, then it will run that code for you, so you can force it. What about some ingredients? What, about, what if we want to do a little bit more? We want to share those static variables. Why would we want to share these static variables? We want to share them across methods or different functions throughout our site. This is a little bit rare. It was a lot more common in earlier versions of Drupal than in Drupal 9, 9 and 10. All of this really uses a little tiny bit of Drupal API called Drupal Static which has been around forever. And they even tried to get rid of it in Drupal 8, but it's still there in Drupal 10. Not marked as, uh, not, and it's not marked as deprecated the last time I checked. So it's part of Drupal core, and it assigns a uni globally unique name to a static variable. 
So when do you want to use this? When the static variable is used in multiple functions or methods, and you need a consistent reset API. If you don't need any of these things, you can just use the static variable method I mentioned earlier. So here's what that looks like. The format's a little bit different, but you'll notice that we have stat, Drupal static equals cache. We have an ampersand here because we're getting the reference to that variable, not copying it. And then we have some other stuff here. We're going to set the name of our static variable, and we're going to tell it that the value is false by default. And then the rest of it is pretty much like you saw before. Now what's this, what's this function thing? Well, this is actually a constant. It's part of PHP, and it's replaced with the current function name that this is defined in. I actually like using this a lot more than just specifying a name, because functions in PHP are already globally unique. If you define a function in a dot .module file, everyone can see it. Everyone. If they are not namespaced or sandboxed. Also, I find that it's easier refactoring if I decide to change my function name. The key also changes, so I don't need to worry about it. What if I want to do this in a class? Methods are not globally unique. They only have to be unique within their class. So function won't work. You can use function in a class, but you'll just get the method name. So how do you fix this? Well, it turns out there's another constant. We just swap it out with one called method. Astonishing. <laughs> method. It's like function, but it includes the class and the namespace so that it is globally unique throughout your entire project. How do you reset this stuff? Well, there's Drupal static reset, and then you just pass the name of the variable you want to reset. That's it. If you're going to overwrite the var variable, you don't need to worry about that. You can just call Drupal static like normal. Okay. I actually grew those potatoes myself. <laughs> Let's talk about some flexible static caching. So, so far, all of the examples I've shown had no parameters whatsoever when we called those functions or methods. But now we want to add parameters to them. So we want to have different results, but we want to make sure that they're the same function or method that we call each time and still have them cached. Turns out the pattern is really easy to do this. Instead of a, a scalar value like null or false, you set it to an array. Then you use the parameters as a cache key in order to see if it's been set. And if it has been set, you can just return it. That's it. That's the entire pattern. And it's very effective across multiple different projects. So you want to use an array and use the parameter as the key and generate it only for that given value. So every time you call that method with the, that parameter, you get that result back. And if you've done it once before, you get the cached result back. Done. This is only useful for scalars, however, usually only string and integers. You can do it with bool and float, but it's a little weird. <laughs> but we're in Drupal. We're going to be dealing with reference parameters a lot of the time, like objects and arrays. So how do we deal with that? We generate a unique cache key. Now, nodes and entities already have this handled for us. So we have a node here. We're going to get the node ID. The node ID is already unique, so we're just going to use that as our unique cache key. Done. No problem. What if we have multiple parameters that we have to deal with? It's the same idea, but we're going to do a little bit more complicated work in order to get our cache key. We're going to do some longer keys and some hashing to make sure that we don't run into any kind of weird uniqueness issues. So how this looks is we have a node, we have two parameters this time, and we have this really nasty looking line here. And what this really does is it takes all of our parameters, the node ID and the two scalar parameters, and turns them into an array. It then concatenates them, separating them all with a full colon. For some reason, Drupal likes using full colons for cache keys. I don't know. You can use whatever you want. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and then afterwards, you can MD5 that entire thing to get a unique hash code that has a consistent short length. That way, you actually have a standard value that matches this param of these parameters every single time. And the rest of the function is exactly as it was before. There is no difference whatsoever. OK, that's all good within the same request. But what if we want to go across requests? That's all little stuff. We want some real stuff. So let's finally get some actual breakfast into us. <laughs> And we're going to talk about persistent caching. Persistent caching is an essential part of your site. 
What it does is it allows programmers and module developers to store particular values to a persistent store, usually the database. What is it, Mini-Me? What about Redis and Memcache? Okay, why do you, you don't want to learn any new APIs. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. We don't want to learn another API. Fortunately, you don't have to. You don't have to learn another API if you're going to use Redis and Memcache because the Redis and Memcache modules provide drivers which plug into the existing Drupal Cache API backend. So you don't have to know anything about Redis and Memcache to use Redis and Memcache for the Cache API. It is the same cache, uh, it's a different cache backend, but the same API. So what does that Cache API look like? Well, you can get it by using the, uh, the Drupal Utility class and calling Cache to interact with the Cache backend. This is the Cache API. I'm not kidding. That's pretty much all of it right there. This is everything that you normally need to do in your everyday life. You get the cache backend, you can set a value using set, you can get a value using get. That's it, that's the whole thing. You don't need to know about Redis, then cache, database tables, any of that stuff, it all does it for you. But you might be going, well, what if we want, well, what if we have a lot of keys in our cache? Well, there's a mechanism that we can prevent something called key stomping. Bins are actually a mechanism by which Drupal divides up caches into separate logical groups. And this helps avoid one bit of code somewhere in your site using one cache key and some other bit of code in your site using the same cache key and stepping on each other. Instead, both of those could use their own bin and they can play by themselves. How to use different bins? Doesn't this look exactly the same except for one parameter that we pass to the cache API? So when we get the cache from the Drupal utility uh, uh, class, we actually pass it the bin name. And then after that, it's just set and get, like normal, nothing different. There are a number of different common cache bins that you can get from Drupal out of the box. The default is usually the one that you want to use for most of your stuff. It is regularly accessed data. There is also a data cache that you can use for things which are less accessed. And there's a bunch of other stuff that are typically used internally that you almost never have to touch. So where does all this cache stuff end up? Well, typically it ends up in a bin named database table. If it goes to Redis or Memcache, it's going to end up somewhere in there. <laughs> Different bins usually can have different drivers. You can, in fact, configure Drupal to say, this bin goes to Redis, this bin goes to the database table, this one goes to Memcache. Why you would do that, I don't know, but you can do it. <laughs> but you might be looking at all these different bins that Core provides. Have you seen the bins, Rakust? And you're going, someone actually got that joke. I'm so happy. <laughs> And you might be looking at all these fine bins and go, but I want my own bin. I want just my own stuff in it. Well, guess what? You can have that. But first we have to have lunch. I like making pizza, by the way. <laughs> so let's talk about custom cash bins. Custom cash bins are defined as a service. There is actually no need to boilerplate a class in order to set up your own custom cash bin. You just need to create one YAML file. So, in your module, you want to add another file, if it doesn't exist already, called myservices.yaml. And then in that, you want to define something like this. Under the services key, you want to define something which is cache dot and then your cache bin name. Typically, my pattern is to create a bin for a module. So I just name the bin after the module and take advantage of the module's unique namespace already within Drupal. The rest of this stuff is basically just scaffolding it out as this is a cache backend. And the only other important thing is this last one, which is the argument, which is the bin name. That's it. Once you define this, you have another bin. How do you, how do you use it? Well, you just pass in your name. You're done. There's your cache bin. You're done. You don't need to worry about anything else. Or you can use the services function instead and get the fully qualified cache backend name. Now, there are reasons why you want to do this, because you might want to inject your cache into something else within Drupal, <coughs> such as forms, plugins, and, contr and controllers. So here's a controller. We have a create function which grabs the container, and it's going to get the cache bin from the container, and then it's going to initialize it, storing that as a variable inside the class. And that actually gets this controller access to the cache 
as a regularly initialized variable with no access to the, the Drupal super global. You're perfectly great. But you might think, great, that sounds great. Tess, now we all just have to add that to all my service controllers and all my plugins and all my forms. Oh God. There's got to be an easier way. <laughs> and the thing is that there is an easier way, and this is something that I have been doing for years that I absolutely love. It's called the module service pattern. It encapsulates most of the module logic inside of a single service. And then you can embed the cache service into the module service. So how do you create a service? Well, you can create it the old-fashioned way, but I just use Drush because Drush Generate is right there. It will work for any module that you want. And if the module doesn't exist, you can have Drush make the module too. <laughs> it will prompt you for the names, the dependencies, and the module name that you want the service to be defined in. Typically, I like defining a, a module level service right after I generate the module itself. If I, I ask myself, is this module going to be anything than a few hooks? If it is, I make a module service. I don't care, I'm not gonna argue it. If it, even if that module service has one method in it, I don't care. <laughs> Usually it saves my butt as a project goes on and features are added. So we add that to our services.yaml and we also add our service class to our module under the source directory. So we have this and you'll notice that in our module service, my underscore module, we're also injecting our cache service. I don't think you have to put them in or in read down, top down order for reading, but I like to, probably because you know I've been around computers way too long. <laughs> so how does this look like in a service? Well, we have our service, we have our cache backend. We're going to get that from our constructor and assign it internally, and then afterwards we can just use it like normal. No big deal. You can combine all of these various techniques as needed in order to actually get even more caching out of your site. You can make a cache service, you can, you can make, use Drupal static, you can use multiple different aspects in order to actually cache all of your data. The nice thing about the module service pattern is that it's very tidy and transparent. It tends to centralize a whole bunch of code changes that usually are spread across your module inside one easy to locate thing. And typically a lot of other modules will find it very easy to find your functionality because they're going to look for the, mo uh, the service in services.yaml that's named after the module. Very easy to find, oh, there's the API, done, good. This is the cleanest that my kitchen's ever been. <laughs> what about manipulating the cache? Manipulating the cache is mostly going to be about cache invalidation we, because cache data can get stale over time. By, you know, we want to invalidate that data by name, by time, or by grouping. We only want to invalidate what is needed because if we, and we want to avoid running a cache clear all. Modules can in fact do a cache clear all internally and you should never do it unless if you have a good reason. <laughs> I know, I see some faces out there. We've all done that. <laughs> okay, so how do you de delete some, uh, some cache entries? Well, you get the cache backend, and you can call delete with the cache key. But really, that's, that's it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> if you want to delete multiple, you can pass an array with different cache keys, or you can do a delete all because you just want to get rid of everything that's inside that bin. But please be careful with that one because you can cause an outage with that too if your cache table is particularly big or very well accessed. But deleting a key is hold hat. We want to be lazy. We want to have the computers do the work for us. So there's another mechanism which I'm very fond of called a TTL. That's called a time to live. It's the seconds remaining since creation before a cache entry expires. How do you set a TTL? Guess what? It's just the third parameter that you didn't know existed on, ca on cache bin set. And that's going to be the number of seconds that that entry is going to live. You don't have to do anything else. In six hours from which the set is called, that entry gets removed. I think it's a little bit more complicated. It waits for the next request for someone who has a zero or a negative TTL and then it gets removed. But for the, for the larger perspective, it's just gone after that and you don't need to worry about that. Combined with all of the other patterns that we have already discussed, you will be able to have your code instantly respond to the cache entry not existing and just generate a new value. 
And that's exactly what you want. There is, in fact, a default TTL because we weren't specifying this value, and it's cache permanent, which means it's cached forever, you know, until some dingus in operations decides, oh, I'll hit cache clear all. That'll fix it. So how long do you want your cache entries to actually live? Shorter is preferred by editors, but longer is preferred by operations. Editors want things to show up on the page fast, but operations are like, please stop doing that. The servers are melting. <laughs> so remember, you only get to pick two of these. You, don't, you can't have them all. So the way that I've handled it historically is I've made it configurable because every situation is different and subject to context. So you want to be mindful of your minimum and maximum TTLs. The minimum TTL is going to be how impatient is my editor actually going to be in an emergency situation on a Saturday when things are literally on fire. And usually that gets down to maybe 15 minutes, sometimes an hour. For the maximum, it can be how long do you expect your sustain, a sustained traffic surge to happen? Is it going to be a few hours, a few days, a week? Maybe you should kind of have those options available. And then default somewhere to a happy medium. And then after that, it is the site's configuration's problem. You can just have the site configuration be changed as it's need to. In order to make it configurable, you want to set up a module settings form. This is also another thing that you can do with Drush Generate Module. You can run Drush Generate Module immediately, even after a module has been coded for a while. Just keep it in uh, Git Config because it will have weird collisions with the code that it generates that you have to manually fix. Also, where do you put it in the menu? I like putting it under system because I like being lazy, and system is there on every Drupal install, and I can just find it. The module service pattern helps you here as well because you can have the module service actually load the config whenever it's instantiated. This way all the TTLs become transparent. So we're going to pass in our config factory to our module service, and then in that we're going to initialize it. We get the config factory, but instead of storing the config factory, we just get our module's configuration right in the constructor, and then we're done. Then we have another method down here, which is going to give us the time to live. And you'll notice that we're using Drupal static here as well, so that every time we pull it from config, we also cache that value within the same request. We also cast it to an integer so that it's always an integer, and if it's not defined, we give it a default of an hour. After that, it becomes really easy to do something with the same exact pattern that we have seen again and again and again, only this time, our third parameter is this get TTL. So our module always defines the TTL. Drupal static always will cache that value so we can call it as many times as we want. Boom, done. Never have to worry about a TTL again. But TTLs are only one mechanism that you can use to invalidate caches. There are also cache tags, and cache tags really confuse the heck out of a lot of people. They allow a particular bin to be divided up by assigning particular tags to cache entries. And you can do this within the same bin or across multiple bins. And that's an important thing to know. There are several different tag names that are available. You can use anything as long as, as it's unique within the system, but there's a number of different common ones, including your module and then a unique key, the entity type and then an entity ID, and then Drupal Core likes using the literal word config and then a configuration name to, cache con uh, to do tags for configuration caching. Typically, though, you define the tags, not the user, so don't make this configurable. Always choose it yourself for maximum uniqueness. So how do we use a cache tag? Well, we get our cache backend. We're going to generate our tags. In this case, we have an entity type and then the entity ID. And then whenever we do a cache bin set, it's the fourth parameter this time that does the tags. And it's just an array of strings. That's it. That's how you set a cache tag. How do you invalidate tags? This is where it gets a little bit confusing because you can't go to Drupal cache in order to invalidate a tag. There's a third service you have to pull up called cachetags.invalidator, and that's where you can do your tag invalidation. So we pull out the cache tags invalidator service, and then we can just call invalidate tags, passing an array of cache tags to, to invalidate. So next slide, we. 
what is a mini-me? This is twice <laughs> in this presentation. <laughs> actually, yes, this is actually how you clear a node's cache. If you want to clear a node's cache, you use the cache tag invalidator. So this is what you actually do. So you get your node, and there's actually a method on that node called get cache tags to invalidate. Nice, short, tidy name. <laughs> and this will get you an array of all the cache tags that that node has, and you can pass that to the cache invalidators invalidate tags parameter. And even better, this is part of entity interface, so it works on all your custom entities as well. All right, let's talk about render caching. Oh boy. <laughs> There's a number of different ways you can control render caching, but generally you're going to talk about the cache key. And you can set this for any render array, sometimes it works. I kid you not, there's actually some weird magic that happens underneath <laughs> the covers, and you may hit another caching layer in trying to implement render caching. So that could become a bit of a fact-finding mission for you. Okay, so we have our render array, we're calling my theme, we have our cache tag, and we have max age tags and contexts. You might be going, wait a minute. Oh, that looks familiar. I think I know what that is already. Well, guess what? It's the same idea as that you already know now. <laughs> so max age is a TTL, tags are just cache tags. But what the heck is this context thing? Well, cache con no, render ca arrays actually can be cached by context or an aspect of the request. There's a number of di uh, different ones of these, such as the currently logged in user, the currently selected language, the URL, and a whole bunch of others. There's a page on Drupal.org which lists a lot of the more common ones. Most of the time, how do you use them? It's like cache tags. You just pass in an array of strings. But which ones are you going to use? User is really common, but another one that's really, really common is the URL context, because this is the one that usually is going to hit for most anonymous users. It has multiple parts that you can use. The base one is URL, which is the entire URL, protocol, query parameters, the whole dang thing. Then there's just query arguments. You don't care about the path, you don't care about the URL, you just want the arguments. And then there's a particular argument because you may be writing a controller and only care about that particular argument. So you want to be as specific as possible when using these, these contexts because if you use an overly broad context, your caching can appear broken. I actually had that call on a project and I know someone in this room knows exactly which one I'm talking about right now that I had to go and fix. <laughs> so, dessert some anti-caching recipes. Those were, that was some really good peach ice cream, by the way. So we're not really going to be defeating cache in this section. I pulled a bit, a bit of a bait and switch on you. I'm sorry it's frozen yogurt, not ice cream. Oh, <laughs> Lazy builders allow you to put a placeholder in the output rendered in Drupal, and that's replaced at a later stage of rendering. A later stage, not bypassing cache. How do you, uh, so here is a controller which is passing out a render array, which is incredibly boring. So we know how this works. However, how do we use this with a lazy builder? So here's the, uh, the lazy builder version. We have ha hashtag lazy underscore builder, and then we're going to actually pass an array with the class name and then the method name. And then the method that we have below actually produces the render array. So you might be doing this and go, wait a minute, what's this trusted callback error I'm getting? You might have run into that when doing some Drupal updates around Drupal 8.9. <laughs> well, a trusted callback is actually a code mitigation, uh, a code injection mitigation. And it's particularly important if you're using the big pipe module because every lazy builder actually exposes what that callback is to the user in a way that you can access before JavaScript up and replaces it. So you want to be careful with that and always use trusted callbacks. You can find a detail about the CR right there at that tiny, tiny little link that you can find in the presentation. Using the trusted callback interface is really easy, fortunately. It implements trusted callback interface, and way down at the bottom of this exactly the same class is one more method, which is called trusted callbacks, and it passes the, an array of all the method names that we're using as trusted callbacks. That's, that's it. That's the whole thing. 
You can use di uh, different callback methods with a lazy builder. You can actually use any callable, any function, any method, any static method, any one of those that you want. Oops. It can be any static method or fully qualified string of a static method. But you might be going, static only? That's like really old fashioned. I want to inject my services instead. Fortunately, there is in fact a service pattern for lazy builders, which actually gives you the service name and then the method name with one colon in between them. And this is the method that I typically use. Also, this method is no longer static. This can actually be a regular method on your service, and your service is initialized as normal in order to run the, uh, run the lazy builder. So here's what that looks like. Here's our service. It now implements trusted callback interface. We have one call, trusted callback called render, and then render just render stuff. That's it. You might have lots and lots of different render methods. In that case, you might want to consider splitting them out from your module service and into a module.render service. Sometimes you may have a module.block service as well in order to handle lazy loading for blocks. Speaking of blocks, we're going to get to that as soon as I talk about passing parameters because I forgot about this section. <laughs> so passing parameters. What if I want to pass a parameter to a lazy builder? Well, it's an array. You add more stuff to the end of the array. But it's got to be scalars only. So don't pass any classes, pass the class IDs. So if you're going to pass a node or an entity, pass the entity ID. That's how you get around that problem. Here's how that would look. So we have our, uh, our render array, lazy builder. We're calling our service lazy builder, passing it a node ID. And because we can, we're also adding the cache tags from that entity as well to the same render array. But what about blocks? Blocks are, a, you can use this exact pattern with one little caveat which will drive you nuts. Cla um, blocks actually have an additional method on them that's called get cache max age and it inherits that from cacheable dependency interface. You've probably never heard of this because I didn't until I was troubleshooting it for three hours one day. <laughs> and this only, you have to, uh, set this, you have to override this in your block class in order for you to quote unquote bypass cache for a block. So here's a block. You'll notice that this block does absolutely nothing except calls a lazy builder. And then we have a method called get cache, uh, get cache max age, and we just always return zero. That way, whenever this block is called, it is actually going to be invalidated, will be rerun, and then the lazy builder kicks in and does all of its stuff. And then the lazy builder, hopefully, will be using a whole bunch of persistent caching and static caching in order to make sure that those values are generated quickly. And this is, in fact, all of those techniques on top of each other is an effective way to get per user block content, but only when logged in. Logged out, you're kind of out of luck. Again, anonymous caching is really aggressive in Drupal 9. You can't really defeat it. So if you want some more information on this topic, you can find a few of these links on here, at cache tags in Drupal.org, the render API over, uh, overview on Drupal.org, and this wonderful post on hashbag code about lazy builders, which is absolutely excellent, and I highly <coughs> recommend that you read it. I want to give a special thanks to everyone uh, to this event for having me today for 107 for sponsoring my time, and you as well for all being here today and watching my bizarre antics. You can find this presentation on github.io. Yay. Yay. I had four minutes. <laughs> That's incredible. Are there any questions, or is uh, you know an uncomfortable silence going to depend descend on us all? <laughs> yes. I say I actually found out why you have to do that with blocks, mm -hmm. because blocks are already lazy built by default. So you're putting really? a lazy builder in a lazy lazy oh built. I didn't know that. Uh -huh. so That's cool. That is why you have so many cursed blocks and putting in cacheable metadata in your arrays because they're already built late. Wow, I had no idea. That's cool. Anything else? Yes. Uh, PHP and Drupal new here, so uh, probably a little question, but is the 
like Drupal static, that's Drupal caching like the PHP variable, or is PHP doing any caching itself as well? So it's basically storing values in a big static array inside of a globally accessible within a Drupal project function. That's all it really does. You can make it yourself in probably about six or seven lines of code. It's got some other fancy stuff wrapped around it, but that is what it really does. Um, whether or not to use static or Drupal static really depends on if you need to share that variable. And I have found that with proper uh, object-oriented design using like the service module pattern, the module service pattern, I have used that less and less and less. And I've often found maybe I should just start using regular static variables within the methods instead because it's simpler and I don't need to worry about a lot of stuff. And it's more, you know, general PHP instead of Drupal specific. So I'm thinking about that myself, but both options are there. I just have a comment. I've watched a lot of sessions and had a lot of conversations with caching. This was exceptional. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad for a $25 outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all? All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.